Hello and welcome to another edition of Currently in Quincy. I'm Joe Catalano. Today we welcome two professors from Quincy College and learn a little bit about the roots of Black History Month and also hear an immigrant story. First though, we check weather and news for you. Currently in Quincy, it's kind of gray and damp out there. 41 degrees right now. Could have some off and on showers throughout the day today. Some drizzle and fog with highs in the mid 40s. Clearing out this evening, lows will drop off into the low lower 30s. Tomorrow some sunshine, but it'll be brisk and breezy. The wind will have a bit of a bite to it tomorrow with the temperatures only in the mid 30s and wind chills even colder than that. A little better on Sunday. Lots of sunshine and highs in the upper 30s. And we start a warming trend on Monday, turning milder with partly cloudy skies. Highs Monday right around 50 degrees. Could be closer to 60 degrees by next Wednesday. Right now though, gray and damp, 41 degrees here in Quincy. Checking out news for you today, the Quincy 400 celebration next year is expected to reap some big financial rewards for the city. The city council recently approved spending $600,000 from the city's hotel motel tax fund to begin planning the events for 2025. Chief Financial Officer Eric Mason predicted that for every dollar the city spends on Quincy 400, it will earn back almost three. Now we're seeing about every $1 investment producing between like about $2.17 and a little over $3. Uh, that's really, really early on and kind of blanket. It's probably gonna be more than that, but I'm gonna go with the most conservative output I have right now. Uh, and so if we, if we do 600000 it wouldn't surprise me to see $1.8 million in additional economic activity. It is important to contextualize. The city does about $3.3 .3 billion in economic activity a year. Uh, so that's still pretty impressive. If you're putting 600000 and you're getting, uh, you're getting about half a percent of what we call uh, shock output. This year, the city says it will begin planning events that could include concerts, lecture series, museum exhibits, programs in the schools, and expanding existing events, including the Lunar New Year and Flag Day and Christmas parades. Eight more speed restrictions along the MBTA's red line have been removed after some extensive track work earlier this month. The T says they have removed speed restrictions southbound between Davis and Porter and Alewife and Davis and northbound between Davis and Alewife. Crews installed 2,500 feet of new rail. They replaced dozens of signals and switches and performed critical sealing work on some of the tunnels. The service was suspended for 10 days between the Alewife and Harvard and Park Street stations in the evenings in order for the work to be completed. Crews also cleaned and painted many wooden benches, made upgrades to flooring, stairways and handrails, improved HVAC systems and station signage. The T says the 10-day shutdown from February 5th through the 14th allowed crews to perform work that would have taken at least six months to complete during temporary shutdowns. The T also says more red line shutdowns are planned on the Braintree branch from March. Early voting for the March 5th Super Tuesday presidential primary election begins tomorrow. And here in Quincy, City Clerk Nicole Crispo explains that early voting will take place in the Great Hall at Quincy City Hall. Voter registration and party change, um, the last day to register to vote, um, the last day to make any party changes for the March 5th election, February 24th, will be here till 5 p.m. That's also the first day of early voting. So next Saturday, this Saturday, coming up, um, we'll be here from 8.30 a.m. till um, 5 p.m. for early voting, voter registration, and last day for a party change. Um, February 25th, um, we'll be here from 8.30 to 2.30 for early voting, that's Sunday. Um, and then Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 in the council chamber for early voting. Um, deadline to request a mail-in ballot is February 27th. 
As Chris Bo just said, the last day to request that mail-in ballot for the March 5th primary is next Tuesday. The mail-in ballots must be received at the city clerk's office by March 5th at 8 p.m. There is a ballot drop box located outside City Hall. And of course, in-person voting will take place March 5th, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at all 31 precincts in Quincy. Chris Bo says some changes have been made to several polling locations to make it easier for voters to access the polls, and there will be no school on March 5th to allow for voting. Well, the Quincy Planning Department has received national recognition for its role in helping Manit Community Health Center open a radiology suite at their West Quantum Street headquarters in North Quincy. For the sixth time, the department has won the Audrey Nelson Community Development Achievement Award from the National Community Development Association. Recently, Quincy Community Development Director Sean Glennon and Manit's CEO Cynthia Sierra accepted the award during a ceremony held in Washington, D.C. The award recognizes exemplary use of federal block grant funds in meeting the needs of disadvantaged populations and low-income neighborhoods. Manit's new radiology suite opened last June and has already provided over 500 mammograms and more than 725 x-rays. The suite is operated in partnership with Boston Medical Center. Well, visiting hours will be held this coming Sunday for Quincy attorney and philanthropist George Burke. Burke died on February 14th at the age of 91. Burke was a former city councilor, state representative, and Norfolk County District Attorney. He was well known for his support of many civic groups and local charities, including Interfaith Social Services, Father Bill's Place, Sasha YMCA, and Salvation Army. Burke is also remembered for purchasing the John Quincy Silver Tankard at an auction back in 2001 for $200,000 and then loaning it to the city, where it's still on display at Old City Hall. The United First Parish Church was forced to sell that tankard to fund some needed repairs to their building. Burke was also a standout basketball player at Quincy High School, Thayer Academy, and UMass Amherst. Burke is survived by two sisters, five children, and 14 grandchildren. The visiting hours are Sunday from 3 to 8 at the Cohane Funeral Home, with a funeral mass Monday at 10.30 at St. Anne's Church and burial at Pine Hill Cemetery. Donations in lieu of flowers may be made to Father Bill's place. It's our check of news for you today. Coming up, we learn about the history of Black History Month from two Quincy College professors. That's next. Welcome back. February is Black History Month, and of course the last weekend of February is right upon us here, so I thought we wanted to get some more information about what the history of that <coughs> month really is. And I thought to do that, I would reach out to some teachers. And uh, here in Quincy, that means uh, right next door here at Quincy College, two professors are joining us in studio to talk, uh, first of all, about the history of Black History Month and also about one woman's experience as an immigrant to this country. So please welcome uh, doctors Cheryl Prophet and Ken Texera. Welcome to you both. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for having us. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Ken, great to see you again. Great to see you. Uh, and Cheryl, nice to meet you for the first time. Nice uh, meeting you, too. Hopefully not the last time <laughs> <laughs> for you to come on over. But Ken, I was thinking about this really all month long, saying what can we do here at QATV to talk about Black History Month? And I said, well, I don't know, but there are people in the city that do. And you are a professor of psychology and sociology right, mm -hmm. at, at Quincy College. So uh, a perfect person to educate us. Well, I'm so happy to be here. And Black History Month actually started as Black History Week. Okay. And then it was picked up by colleges who would do more programming during the month to really look at and try to create a platform for underrepresented voices. Mm. And then in 1976, President Ford actually made it a federal monthly holiday, and it's been ratified and brought back every month si or every year since. And every year has a specific theme, which is interesting too. So oh. this year's theme is the arts. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, okay. so every time, uh, every year this comes along, there's a different kind of focal point on it. Mm -hmm. What I love about it, and for my students, and for myself in school, is to really dig deep into the literature of psychology and try to find out what voices may we have been whispers that we can put on a platform mm. and, and learn more about. Okay, so when did it actually start as first Black History Week? Um, Black History 
every week. It was, uh, I think it was like 50 or 60 years prior to uh, that. Okay. And then it just slowly kind of evolved into what it is today, very okay. organically. Okay, so well before the Civil Rights Movement, certainly. And that was a response to the Civil Rights Movement, just to kind of create more of an academic dialogue to try to really focus on it. Okay. Starting with historians and then into all, all corners of our society. Yeah, how has it kind of transformed over the years? So one thing that's been amazing is since 1976 and as a result of the, uh, the civil rights movement is it's an opportunity to develop and talk more about black voices. So particularly in psychology, one thing that's interesting is ideas of black identity models and looking at transsectionality and intersectionality of different people. Because sometimes it might not be just someone's skin tone or background that's the most important thing to them. And early in psychology and looking at trying to create more of a dialogue and fairness within psychology, what we've developed is kind of a way to look at people's race and ethnicity and their gender and their sexual orientation or their poverty mm. status. So we started to slowly move away from this concept of being privileged or not and then looking at the specific context that people come from. A holistic so, approach. Yeah. Right. And it's really changed the sort of landscape for what we understand. And, you know, we have to thank black um, sociologists and psychologists like Kimberly Crenshaw for that concept of intersectionality to really see as a prism how we can look through uh, eyes of other people and understand their kind of struggles and their strengths and their their you know toils and kind of coming to where they are. Yeah. How have um, so this this year's theme is the arts. How have the arts been represented this month in Black History Month um, at Quincy College? Well, what's wonderful is I'm talking to different English faculty and they're looking at the Harlem Renaissance. Oh. And so the Harlem Renaissance is the birthplace of jazz music oh. in the 20s in Harlem. So um, then we can look at hip hop music mm -hmm. and all the contributions of voices of our Black and Brown brothers and sisters in the community and Basquiat and art and art history and different um, people that have just really contributed that might not have always had the platform. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, so for the rest of this month, you know, like another week or so left, um, do you want your students to do anything? Have you given them assignments, you know, for Black History Month research or, or the, work in the community? One thing that I've uh, really been looking at with my students um, he, in Quincy and in Plymouth is yeah. grandparents raising grandchildren ah. and then the disproportionate amount of people that, you know, come from other ethnic status that sure. might need more support and just you know we can also see intersections of different troubles that happen in our society from like substance misuse and different things where you know grandparents aren't expecting to raise their grandchildren full-time mm. and there's not a lot of resources out there mm -hmm. so that's one thing we're trying to do in the community to raise kind of profile in the voices another thing is looking at a, our own ethnic identity and when preparing for this with with Dr. Prophet it was we can't really understand another person's culture until we really kind of embrace our own yeah. so people are writing about their own, you know, backgrounds and, you know, their uniqueness. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and Dr. Prophet, you have a unique story uh, in coming from uh, Guyana, Guyana, right? Yes, uh, yes. Here to the United States. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how that, how that happened. So uh, in Guyana, I was a registered nurse and there were some individuals that came to Guyana through the embassy and they requested nurses, they were recruiting nurses. So they requested that if you're interested, you fill out this application, and if you pass, then they would give you a visa to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I did, I was interested, I did. I took the exam, I passed, and then I came, and I was working at a hospital. They gave us, um, I think, a year. While you're there, you have to take the boards, the NCLEX exam mm -hmm. for the United States. So I did that, I passed. And then I moved from there, I went to another facility, which was Spalding Hospital. Oh. I worked there for a while. In the meantime, I continued to advance my career. I did the Bachelor's of Nursing, and then eventually I did the um, Master's in Nursing oh. and in Education. So then after that, I moved to, um, I continued at Spalding, and then I said, okay, I want to do something else. I don't just want to have all these degrees and not use it productively. I see. So I said, okay, I'm going to do the master's, the um, doctors in nursing education now because I already have a master's. So why not do the doctors in education? So I did that at uh, Regis College. I see. <coughs> so after I completed that, I said, okay, I need to pass all my knowledge on to someone, hmm. to some you know people who were coming after me. So then I um, applied for the teaching job at Quincy College. 
So I got the job at Quincy College. I was teaching in the PN program. That's a practical nurse program, which I love. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm teaching, my focus there was to teach and help those students. I want them to realize that, you know, there's no limitations. Mm -hmm. You can do anything you want to do. You just have to, you know, put the effort into that. Yeah. So my focus was on the students. I helped them, and I wanted them to see that, okay, Professor came from a different country, yeah. and she was able to do all of this. She, to, even though there were problems along the way in terms of like race and things like that, which those problems were a minority, okay. not a majority. Yeah. There were very nice people along the way who helped me. Because there were things you would say that have different meanings where you come from than what it is here. So I had nice people that I worked with that helped me to understand that. And you know, I was able to change my terminology. I see. So yeah, so the students, and I love Quincy College. I love Quincy College because of the diversity. Yes. The students are different races, races, you know, we have so much diverse uh, population. So I was so happy because I was able to help them along the way. You know, if you're coming from a different country, you have different terminologies, you have different way of reading, you have different way of understanding. So because I have that knowledge now mm. that I'm here for a while, I'm able to help those students. Yeah. So what obstacles um, did you face you know, when you first arrived? And so what obstacles do you see your students facing now? So when I first arrived, there were, you know, there were people who would think that, okay, why are you here? You, know? you don't belong here because of your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. But then that um, fuels you to show them that, okay, this is why I'm here. I'm going to get my education. Yep. I'm going to move forward to be on the same level as you are. So that was one. And sometimes in language, you know, we have different terminology that we use. That was another issue. Mm -hmm. But that was fine. I mm -hmm. mean, if you have people around you, you surround yourself with people that like you and try to help you. So I had a lot of those people around me. Sure. And what are your students uh, saying that are some of their obstacles they're facing today? And how might that have been different from when you yes. first arrived? Yeah. Today, they still ha they struggle with the language. Still, yeah. Yes, okay. language barrier. And as educators, um, we try to help them. Mm -hmm. There are different ways and things that we do to help these students, you know, make questions shorter. You don't want long questions that because of their language barrier, mm. they have to take a long time to read those questions before they can understand. So we are trying to eliminate that and make it easy for them to read. We're not changing the content, but we're changing how they read mm -hmm. the question. So making it shorter so they can, you know, because if, uh, Putting them with students who have English as their first language is very difficult. Certainly. Because yep. most of these students have English as their second language, yes. so they struggle more. Yep. But those are the students I like. I like to have yes. them. Yes, so. yeah. Well, you can see yourself in them, I'm sure. Yes, you know, yes. And, and the struggles that they're going through right yeah. now. Yeah. And I, sorry. When, that's okay. When you first came here, Cheryl, what, what was it that motivated you when you were at the embassy in Guyana to say, yeah, I want to go to America and be a nurse there? What, what was going on in your mind at yeah, that time? Yeah, we, we, we were saying that, okay, th these individuals that came, they said, okay, if you write this exam, you can have a visa. And then we looked at each other and said, well, why not? Why not? It was a, it's, it's, it was a group of us yeah. that took it. We okay. were in the same batch, they call it. And we said, why not? So then we came together, we studied together, and then we took the exam and we would pass. And we were like so happy yeah. that we did it. He yeah. said, yes. Did yeah. you come by yourself or did you come with I your came family? By you came by myself first, really? yes, to pave the way for them. I see. And okay. Then came. Sure. Yeah. How many years ago was that? Just even just roughly? Over 20 years. Has it really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Wow. But so you're a professor of nursing now yes. at Quincy College yes. and also a nurse yourself. Yes. Right? Um, how has you know, the nursing profession changed, Cheryl, for people of color? For people of color. So, the, of course, there's the racism part of it, mm. which everyone knows. I mean, it's nothing new. That's it's there. But then, you know, if you're, you're educated, you went through that process, you try to put that behind you mm -hmm. and focus on the goal. So, 
y you know, you don't focus on the bad things people say about you mm. or say things behind you. You don't focus on that. You focus on the good thing. What can I do to help someone? Yes. What can I do to help the students? The students are, um, are, are our focus. So those are the people that I focus on. I see. The so. students. Yeah. Ken, it's, it's interesting. So much of what Cheryl's talking about is is not so much education, but mindsets. You know, mm. and as a professor of psychology and sociology, you must find that very interesting. Oh, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. It was fun just even walking over here because I saw all of her students just root you on. <laughs> oh, is that we're right? just <laughs> celebrating her, and she said, make good choices as they were going off to lunch as she <laughs> could come here. Right. And uh, she is truly a focal point um, of the program because 100% of the folks that graduate have jobs. Yes. Your program is absolutely strong. So this is creating pathways and and this is the beauty of Quincy College mm. is it's an open enrollment mm -hmm. anyone can go if you have the desire to go and you have wonderful professors like like her and myself that want you to succeed right. and uh, we're so lucky so mindset is everything and just being mindful of your experience but then not letting that slow you down is what I'm learning from Cheryl in here today yeah yeah could that perspective be applied to uh, other professions other than nursing absolutely yeah. yes. um, we're teaching sports psychology okay. So looking yeah. at strength-based models of like, what's what are the skills and the talents that you have that make you stand out and uh, and moving beyond some of that, and that's what's so beautiful about that interactionist model where we can start to see like the little slices of all the different parts that can make us mm. strong and identifying and healing from the places where we've been you know hurt too. Sure. So, Shell, you've been in here for 20 years now, at yeah. least, right? What does Black History Month mean to you as a black woman in this country? Well, it gives you a chance to reflect, yeah. you know, on the accomplishments and the struggles mm. and, and, you know, the, uh, that black people, black Americans, black individuals that they have faced throughout history. Mm -hmm. And most of their, some of them, most of their accomplishment are unnoticed, it goes unnoticed until something happens. But, you know, it gives me a t chance to reflect. Also, I do research mm -hmm. and I get more informed mm -hmm. because in, in where my country, we didn't focus so much on Black History Month. We know that, we know about Black History Month, but our focus is not like here we have a month long celebration. Yes. We did. So it gave me a chance to research and reflect on my own culture and my own um, thoughts. Yeah. Do your students tell you that they appreciate having a month where their ethnicity <laughs> is, is yes. appreciated and recognized? Yeah. Yes. They do? Yes, they do. And what do they say? They said they, they, they're hoping that it would have been a month holiday. I said, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just have the whole month off? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's I normal said, to no. think that, right? And <laughs> I said, no, it's just a month of celebration, yeah. you know. And before we came here, I was talking to them about um, one individual that came from um, the Caribbean country. Yes. And I said, who in this class is from this country? Yep. And there were two of them. Okay. And I said, did you know about this person that, you know, black history? But they didn't know. Huh. They, they. So it's, it's good. I, I, I educated them this morning before we came here yeah. about her. Yeah. Do you have um, kind of a role model, I guess, uh, for you know, for black uh, Black History Month, the role model, or or just well, a, in in general, role model. I I um, especially like Mary um, C. Cole, only because she came from Jamaica, mm -hmm. and then she moved on and she went into the Crimean War, mm. and she helped the soldiers, and you know, she was very through her diversity, you know, and sh she had struggles because she wasn't recognized, so that propelled me to look at her as a role model. S say her name again, Cheryl. Sure. Mary Seacole. Mary S e Mary. Yep. S E A C O L E. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Ken? Do you have a, a role model? I do. One yeah. of them is a close colleague and friend of mine, Napoleon Wells, that has a cure for racism and a TEDx talk. Really? And he talks about it as, as like looking at prejudice and yeah. identifying that we all can prejudge people, but then looking at like the harms of racism and mm -hmm. how to look at that in the community and how to heal from it. Mm -hmm. um, I really love William Cross, who I was able to meet uh, with one of my mentors, Dr. Pontorado, and looking at black identity models. Mm. And so I got to meet him in New York City. Uh, 
Um, I also love Finney, who looks at just how much we confront our own ethnic kind of backgrounds, mm -hmm. and then we either assimilate parts of the you know larger culture that we like, and then look at our ethnic model too, and then we can have a blended kind of cultural tradition where we can just be ourselves wherever we go. Sure. So I certainly have a lot of uh, really <coughs> wonderful uh, black. Uh, researchers and scientists and friends that and support me, and Dr. Prophet, yeah. obviously. I was just going to say, because, you have a role um, model right next just, to you. <laughs> but she, just the way she so gently yeah. and, and carefully takes her students through nursing and, and how much they respect her. And, yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, so it's it's so wonderful to see someone who can hold the line for rigid academics, but also be able to provide that warmth and support. Yeah, and inspiration for mm. sure. Um, and, and a woman's perspective, I think, yeah. black or white or any color, yeah. I think a woman's perspective, yeah. Mm. Thank you both, really appreciate the opportunity yeah. to hear your stories and great to meet you, uh, yeah. Doctor. Please come back. I, okay, thank you. So you're very welcome. Just enough time to check the forecast for you for the rest of the day today. Kind of what you see is what you get out there. It's gray, it's damp, it's drizzly, it's in the mid 40s. It's this afternoon. It'll clear out this evening. Lows drop off into the lower 30s. Sunshine returns tomorrow, but it'll be windy and uh, kind of chilly with highs only in the mid 30s. A little warmer on Sunday and a lot warmer on Monday. Thanks again to Doctors Profit and Texera for joining us from Quincy You're College. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks Thank to our you. crew. Thank you for watching. Monday here on the show, we learned about a new fundraiser for the Quincy Animal Shelter. Meantime, check our website, qatv.org. All our latest programs are there. There's news and information, video on demand, live streaming, and a lot more. For all of us here at QATV, I'm Joe Catalano. Have a great weekend.